Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we are talking to Maddie Heredia, who is the Outreach Specialist and a Biologist with the Kentucky Nature Preserves. Hi Maddie, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thanks for talking to us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited, I'm looking forward to this. Let's start out by telling everyone just a little bit about you and what you do. My name is Maddie Heredia. I'm the Outreach Specialist for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. And I kind of have a dual position there where I conduct all our environmental outreach and education programs, but I also am super involved with our Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund program. So if you're not familiar with that program in Kentucky, if you've ever seen the Nature's Finest license plates with the fun animals on it, proceeds from those license plates go to state agencies like ourselves to help purchase natural areas for you all to enjoy. So I also travel around the state and help inspect and monitor those properties as well. I kind of have the best of both worlds. <laughs> it's always fun when you ha get to do multiple different things in a job. Yeah, so switch it up every day. <laughs> oh, yes. No chance to get bored. I've had many of those jobs. <laughs> Were you always interested in the outdoors or is this something that you just got into recently or in college? So I grew up in the Chicagoland area and growing up in the woods and um, that type of stuff wasn't a daily thing for myself. Um, I really credit my love for the environment and our natural world to a few key people in my life, being my parents that would take me camping occasionally. My aunt, who is very into the outdoors, would take me on a trip every year for my birthday. Um, and it's through those experiences that I grew this appreciation and love for our natural world. And through my position, I hope to be that person and give these opportunities to other people that might not have had the resources to do so otherwise. And I think that's the case for many people is that it takes out one special person or few special people in their lives. And that just makes the entire difference with making that connection. Right. Or just, just one special outing or act at, there's uh, I can't tell you how happy it makes me when I do a talk to maybe a school group and by the end of it, they're like, I want to be a herpetologist, not even knowing what that word was beforehand. So um, it's always really uh, heartwarming and great to hear that. Oh, yes, definitely. So one of the parts of your job and your outreach efforts that I am especially interested in talking to you about is your citizen science or community science work. And just as a side note for our listeners, you're probably here, Maddie and I, both using the term citizen science and community science kind of interchangeably. And that's because up until about maybe a decade or so, citizen science was the most commonly used term. And it's still used very frequently, but the term community science is also being um, used a lot more frequently now. And it's kind of Coming up to a point where it might, might be replacing citizen science in many ways, we're talking the same thing. It's just two different terms for the same thing. And as with anything, once you get into the habit of calling something one thing, it's hard to break those habits. And so Maddie and I both will go interchangeably back and forth. Absolutely. And uh, community, I love community science. It's it's very inclusive and it's, it's what you do as a um, when you're doing citizen science is you're coming together as a community to help contribute data to research. And so I love that. Me too. I mean, as you know, from us meeting originally, but many of our listeners may not know, I spent many, many years teaching, developing citizen science projects, community science projects. This is something that is very near and dear to me, something I love doing and teaching. And so I'm loving seeing you take on the mantle in a different location in a different way, but still watching you grow on. Oh, and I'll just add fun fact that I attended one of uh, Shannon's community science programs when I was in college doing some water quality sampling at Mammoth Cave. And um, so Shannon, you kind of helped me into getting into my role and my interest in outreach too. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's always nice to hear that and <laughs> to know that I might have played a small role in helping make a difference. Absolutely. 
Well, as Maddie alluded to, I did spend many years developing and working at Mammoth Cave National Park, developing their citizen science program for middle school through college students. However, for a number of different reasons, I never really used iNaturalist as a tool there. But iNaturalist is something that recently I've become increasingly interested in using for my own purposes. And I think that it's something that many of our listeners would be interested in if they're not already using it. And Maddie uses iNaturalist a bunch in her projects and programs. So that's why I asked her on here today so that she could hopefully share some of her knowledge and experience with us. Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, really since 2018, 2019, we we started using it as a tool to build our natural heritage database. So um, Kentucky Nature Preserves, if you're not familiar with us, we protect over, we have involvement in um, protections on over 150 properties across Kentucky. And part of, you know, conservation and management is learning about what species you have on those properties, what species exists throughout Kentucky. And as you know, we're, you know, we're a, staff about 20 people, but that is a lot of area to cover and we cannot be everywhere at one time. So we've really been using iNaturalist and incorporating it into our projects recently in the last couple of years. Okay. And before we really get started, I guess we should probably take a step back. I know many people that are listening probably at least have an idea about what iNaturalist is if they don't already use it. But I'm guessing there's probably also people um, like my mother who I'm assuming will be listening to this, but who don't know what iNaturalist is, even though they might be excellent people to learn about them because they love learning about nature. They're always outside. They're trying to become better naturalists and learn how to identify things better. So can you tell us a little bit, just start at the beginning, what is iNaturalist? So iNaturalist is a citizen science, community science app, if you will, or tool that allows the general public to collect data by simply using a camera or their phone and take pictures of it um, and upload it to a public global database for everyone to see. And so the really cool thing about this database is it's really well known in the science community. So there's a lot of scientists and researchers that are on there fact checking the data and also finding really cool new discoveries because of it. So just by using this little app that you can download on your phone and taking pictures of things in your backyard or in the natural areas around you, you can help contribute to really cool science. So you said app and you said phone and then you said tool. Is it just something that you can do with your phone or can you use it if you're not using your phone for those sorts of things? So there are two ways that you can use this tool. I call it a tool because um, when you're using it on your phone, it's an app, but um, you can also go onto the iNaturalist website and use a desktop version of it. So I find that the best way for myself to use it is with a smartphone. It's a free download. Just go to your Apple Play Store, your Google Play Store and download the app. You'll have to make an account and from there you can start uploading observations. The desktop version is slightly different. I will say that the app, the iPhone or the smartphone version is a little bit more user friendly than the desktop version. But if you do not have a smartphone, you can still take pictures. Um, if you have a di digital way of taking pictures, whether that be through a camera or something else, you can always you know, upload it through a memory card or something onto your desktop and mass upload those photos into the desktop version later. So um, you can use it on a smartphone or a computer, but I personally just really like the smartphone because it's super handy. I think that's what a lot of people are going to use. I have a smartphone. I still tend to be kind of old fashioned the way I use it, even though I'm not, don't consider myself old, but I still think of the phone is more of a phone and I might take pictures with it if I don't have my camera out. But a lot of times if I'm out wandering around, I'll have my digital camera with me that gives me so much better pictures than my phone. And I've got the lenses that I can get closer views of it. So that's why I was kind of curious is, do I just have to do it on my phone or can I come back, play with my pictures? crop them down so that they're got the species of interest, especially if I'm talking about some small bug. Right. And so that's a really good point to get accurate photos because we'll talk about how important the photos are in identifying. But the nice thing about the phone though, is instead of taking camera, like taking photos with your camera, then having to go home and upload them with your phone, um, you can find out real time right then and there what the species is that you might be looking at. 
And I realized we might have jumped ahead a little bit. And so I kind of want to step back and explain how the tool works with the photos. We're talking about photos and bugs. And some of you might be like, what are they talking about? But yeah, we need to step back. I, I, I agree because <laughs> I know just enough about iNaturalist to be dangerous. Of course, you know, because you use it a lot. Yes. And it's easy to forget that not everybody can jump. So yeah, let's step back a little bit. Yeah, so uh, the way that this tool works, and I'll, I'll just describe it on the phone version, is you download the app, you create an account. From there, you can, you know, you'll be hiking in the woods, you see a plant that you don't know what it is and, if, and you want to know what it is. So all you have to do is take out your phone and within the app, open the app, say click upload an observation. And from there, it'll ask you to either take a picture of your observation being the plant, or upload a picture of it from your phone. Maybe you took it previously and you didn't have service and you want to upload it now. And so you'll take a picture of the plant. You'll, there'll be a screen that'll ask you some parameters about what, what day it is, what time it is, and that'll auto-populate itself usually. Uh, what your exact location is, which I know there's some sensitive species and people worried about, uh, you know, disclosing their personal property location, but there are tools you can choose to obscure lo your location. You can choose to keep it private if you want to, or if you're on a public natural area, uh, which I am most of the times, I just, I, I keep it open for everyone to see. So once you set all those parameters, your picture will go through a process. It'll, it'll do it automatically. It uses photo recognition technology to bring up a list of species or family or genus of, of things that it possibly thinks that this plant is. And that is, if we can just take a second to appreciate that, that blows my mind. And, you know, being a scientist and, you know, knowing what a lot of these species are that I'm looking at already, I, it's, it's always incredible to see how accurate it is. And so, you can select what you think it is. And I know some of you might be thinking, you know, I don't know anything about you know, plants or butterflies or something. So what if I guess and it's wrong? That's okay, because it's just an observation. And so if you're not sure what it is, you can always kind of submit a guess and the science community will then come and fact check it and look at it. So it's kind of like social media for science nerds, which <laughs> I am a, I'm a science nerd, I'm not afraid to admit it. But so in this global database, you, it's not just used for uploading um, observations. You can also look at what people have uploaded around you. And so you can see what other people are uploading and what other people are naming things that might or might not be correct. And this has happened a couple of times where I've gone in and I've seen someone label, let's say, a snake as a black racer when clearly it's a garter snake. And so I, with my profile, I can comment on that and be like, actually, I disagree with your observation. I think it's this. And then if enough people and enough credited scientists agree with an observation, it becomes research grade, meaning that is what it is and it's pretty accurate. So it's, it's, it's a really incredible tool. And it's it's pretty accurate. Now, I will say it's not always 100% and it's it's definitely it's got it can't be perfect. Sometimes the only defining characteristic between one plant species and, the, and another might be the you know the type of hairs on the underside of a leaf. And obviously a photo is not going to be able to capture that, but it can at least get you down to, you know, family genus or species. So, it's a pretty cool tool. <laughs> Just the fact that you can get those IDs like that is amazing, even if it's not real time. I'm just thinking of, oh my gosh, how many pounds of field guides and books have I lugged yes. through the woods because I wanted to be able to ID something in case I didn't know it, yes. just like you said, off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. smartphones are so nice. yeah, smartphones are a lot lighter than all those books. Absolutely, and I I think it's. It's a really good tool for someone like myself who might be tracking things. If I see, you know, a rare species that I know that we track or a species of interest that I know that our botanist or zoologist would like to see, um, rare or not, I will upload it to iNaturalist. And that way it's saved. There's a picture of it. They can go and look at it at any time. But it's also 
a great tool for, you know, people that are just interested in the natural world. You don't have to be a scientist to use this app. You can just be someone who wants to learn a little bit more about what species they have in their backyard or going out hiking. And so I, I always think that it's super important to for people to make that connection or have an appreciation for things. And one of the ways to do that is to learn about it and know, know what it is. And then in the future, you have a little bit more of an appreciation for it. Oh, I completely 100% agree with that. I mean, and even as a scientist, I don't know everything out there. I mean, and so you can't, there's no way you no, can. <laughs> no one does. And so I may be able to identify most of my trees or most of my birds or most of my spring wildflowers, but the little bitty native bees, I'm just starting to learn how to get those to the right family or genus, much less try and get it any further than that. And there's always, even with the plants and stuff that I'm more familiar with, I'm always running into species that I'm just, that's new. What is that? And that's why I carried around pounds of books with me so I could figure out what it was. Yes. And uh, I also will attest to, I don't, I'm not an expert <laughs> at everything. I know a little bit about many things, but I am not an expert. And so, yeah, it's just a really great tool if you want to know, because this might, this happens to me sometimes where I, before I naturalist, where I'm out in the field and I, I see something and I don't know what it is. And I want to know what it is and I'll take a picture of it and I'll look it up later when I get home and then I forget about it. Or you just have a lot of backlog of things that you need to look up to identify where this is, you know, in the technology world, it's, it's instant. It's exactly what it does. So yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Yep. That's the story of my life too, is lots of pictures. I've got, oh yeah, I'm going to look that up and I'm still going to look that up. <laughs> yeah. And the, the unique thing about having all these observations and data collection from all over the state, maybe places that we can't get to some applications that we've used this data in is like I mentioned earlier, our um, natural heritage database, but through, I think it was in 2019, our botanist discovered three new rare plant locations that we monitor just from observations of people uploading stuff to iNaturalist. In August, we held a BioBlitz, which is one of the features that you can, a project that you can host on iNaturalist. And it basically sets perimeters of a, a time and a location. And a bio blitz means you just, whatever the parameters is, you try to get as many observations that fit those parameters within that given time. And so we held one for moth week. And so it was a week long bio blitz and my parameters were just the state of Kentucky. So I encouraged everyone to just go out and take a bazillion pictures of moths and upload them. And through that project, we got several new county records and actually one new state record, which is incredible. It's fascinating that someone just taking pictures of moths that didn't, maybe they knew what they were doing, maybe they didn't, uh, contributed a state record for that species. That is awesome. Yeah. And that's one thing that has really surprised me throughout my career is that we don't know so much about some of what we think are common species or even know if a species is common because we don't have a good idea of what it's what its range is especially if it's something that we see in our yards in our communities and not in those more well-studied parks and pristine natural areas absolutely and and some of the um the species like for example moths or just invertebrates in general like i mentioned are super understudied so we're, we're constantly finding new records and new things every day which is pretty cool yeah, that is cool I mean, I'm like you, you say you're a science nerd. I'm a nature nerd. Um, same thing. We both love geeking out about science. It is as to say, yeah. I'm a nature nerd too. <laughs> Might be why we get along so well. <laughs> so, okay. You can get IDs. You can, sounds like from what the way you were describing it, you can help identify things that other people have done. Yep. And then scientists can mm -hmm. come in and use it on the back end as well. Correct. That data is all publicly stored in an online database. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If I could find out what people are uploading in India, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's a, it's an international globally used tool. And so a lot of people, a lot of scientists and researchers will use that data. Again, they can't be everywhere at all times for research projects or conservation 
projects and learning how to manage, you know, our natural lands the best for these, these species that are there. And it's, it's also used to track some other applications are, you know, tracking global warming and, you know, migration of things based on people building up observation over the years, seeing if things are moving north or phenology, the timing of blooming, people taking pictures of plants blooming in like April this year. And then maybe later down in the road, it's later, it, you know, it's later on. So the more data we collect now, the, the, the wide variety of applications we can use this data for in the future. Yeah. If we don't know, we can't do anything with it. If we've got the data, then we've got a baseline. We can use it mm -hmm. if we need to or when we need to. Now, I know a lot of people, especially if they're not a scientist maybe or just getting started, just getting, just getting a good feel themselves for what different species are, they might see something on iNaturalist and it's identified as, oh, a blue-winged warbler. And they're looking at it going, I don't think so. I think that's... I don't know, something else. And you said that you could say, no, I think it's this, but a lot of people might not feel comfortable, especially if they're just kind of just getting the feel for it themselves. How do you validate that? So if somebody has, is just thinks that it's the wrong thing, do they just say, oh no, I disagree, but I don't know what it is, or I disagree, I think it's this. And how much would you encourage somebody to say that versus, um, just kind of holding their saying, no, that person probably knows more than I do and kind of doing that sort of thing. Have that confidence to do that, especially if we're talking about this being used for scientific research because nobody wants to mess up the science. Absolutely. So um, there's a couple of aspects in there that I kind of want to touch base on. And I'll start with the person who uploaded. So if the person who uploaded you know, this blue winged warbler is not sure if it's that or not. Um, warblers are hard, man. Like they all kind of look the same to me. Especially in the fall. Yes. But that, I mean, that's why we have our classifications, right? So I might not be able to confidently as the uploader, and I don't think that should ever be the goal is I, I have to get this down to species or I've failed. That's not the case. I always say, you know, go on the side of caution and if you're not sure, then that's okay. No one's going to fault you for that. So maybe instead of saying it's this specific warbler, you'd be like, well, I know it's a warbler. It looks like a warbler. A naturalist agrees that it's some sort of warbler. So a naturalist will also give you the option to just say it's a it's warbler family, right? So you don't always have to post it, you know, the very specific species that it is, um, which is super helpful and kind of narrows down the, the false you know, identifications a little bit. Now for someone that is going into the um, exploring other people's observations and thinks that there's something wrong, I encourage you to, especially if you know, if you're, if you're credible in your field or you'll say you're, you know, an ornithologist, a bird biologist, and you know that's wrong, then absolutely say something. And it's, there's, there's no hard feelings. It's not a, you were wrong, I'm shaming you for that. It's just like, well, I think it's this and because of that. So when I said that you could, you know, kind of comment or suggest another ID, there's also a little comment box and it'll say, tell us why. So someone who is an ornithologist and has a little bit more expertise on the defining characteristics of warblers could say, actually, I think it's this warbler because blank, blank, and blank. And it's just a conversation in the science community and we encourage it. And we definitely don't shame anyone for wrong observations. We're all learning, but we do, like you said, it's super important that the data is right. So if you're not sure, that's okay. <laughs> but maybe not, maybe don't suggest something super specific if, if you're not sure, maybe kind of back it up to genus or family, which iNaturalist will give you the options to do. I like that. I like that a lot. And I will say um, there is another program. So iNaturalist is, is for the average person, but for our younger crowds too, maybe, because they might make a little bit more mistakes. <laughs> Their iNaturalist has another app that they produce called Seek. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's made by iNaturalist and it's very similar. It's, it's a little less complicated and I don't think there's, I'm not sure if their data is actually stored in a database but, or if it is, it's not, it's not as well used in the scientific community and it's more for just 
learning what things are. So that's always another option too. But we definitely encourage iNaturalist because we use all of that data in our database. Right. And I love the fact that you were also talking about having that comment form where you can say, this is why I think this is that. Mm -hmm. Because like for me, if I don't know what something is, I don't necessarily want somebody to just say, oh, it's that and go on. I want to know why it's that so that the next time I can go, oh, yeah, I see this and therefore I know it's that. Yeah, that's a great point. And sometimes... Sometimes people in the community will just say, no, I think it's this, but I really encourage saying why um, so that everyone can learn, um, just like you said, so that you can not make that same mistake next time. And so I, I really encourage that if you are on iNaturalist and you are identifying observations to please explain why if someone is wrong. Can you also do that when you're first uploading the picture? So if you think it's that blue winged warbler, but it doesn't quite show everything. You can say something like, okay, I know it's a warbler and that's what I'm identifying it at. And then in the comments say, I think it might be because of these things. Or like you were talking about with the plants, sometimes the only way to identify between two different species is what the hairs are like on the underside of the leaves. So you can set, have the picture of it and then say, underside of the leaves was very hairy and felt soft or felt really rough on the top and the bottom of the leaves to give those extra characteristics that you don't get from a picture. Yes, and I actually just pulled up my phone to double check because I couldn't remember, but there is a, a notes section. So when you upload the picture, it'll say, what did you see? And you click on that and that'll do the, the photo identification and give you some options. But there's a little note section underneath where you can type in anything that'll help other scientists or other people help identify your, your observation. And um, like I mentioned earlier, the phone application is a little bit more basic, easy to use than the computer uh, version. And so the computer version might have all these other parameters that you could fill out if something's in its larval stage or it's an adult stage. And so it gets a lot in more in depth, uh, which is great too. It's just more accurate information. But there is, to answer your question, there is a spot that you can add notes to your, your observations through your phone. Nice. Okay. Is there anything else you want to add on there? Yes. So working for Nature Preserves, I do a lot of uh, public outreach and citizen and community science. And I just wanted to highlight some of the uses of community science. And other than iNaturalist, there are so many other projects uh, around the country that people are using to collect data. So another uh, community science program that Nature Preserves is putting on in collaboration with Dan and Judy Dorson is the distribution of land snails in Kentucky and creating a guide slash atlas book for that. Snails are really understudied in Kentucky. We don't know a whole lot about them. We don't know about what species exist where even. And so over the last year and a half, we have asked citizens, community to collect snail shells, not live snails, but collect uh, just the empty shells of them and, you know, put them in some type of container, uh, old pill bottle container works, and write on a piece of paper where you are, what day it is, and what type of habitat you found them in, and mail them in to either us or Dan and Judy. And so that was a way for us to get Snail, snail shells collected all over the state without average, actually having to be all over the state. And it produced so much good data that is now going into a publication about the distribution of land snails in Kentucky, which is pretty awesome. Some other examples of community science that are applied on the national level is Monarch Watch and their program with monarch tagging. So for those who are not familiar with monarch butterflies, they migrate all the way to Mexico over the winter to stay and overwinter there and then come all the way back to North America to reproduce. And it's, it's an incredible for an insect to do that. And uh, due to habitat loss and climate change, their populations have really been hurting over the years. So in order to document their migration and learn more about it and learn more about how we can apply resources and where they started a monarch tagging program where anyone can go on their website, order tags, catch monarch butterflies. The tag is stuck on a very specific spot on their wing 
um, an identifier tag, and then that butterfly is set free to continue its journey and its migration down to Mexico. From there, researchers in Mexico can learn about which butterflies made it, from where, where were they tagged? And that's, ju that's just another really cool community citizen science program. And the last one I'll mention is one that's been going on and might be one of the longest ones that's existed in the United States is the Audubon Christmas bird count. And so they just ask bird activists or people that enjoy birding to keep track of what they see over the winter time and submit it through a data form to them. And that is another way to massively collect data over a wide area of land. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, there's so many different citizen science, community science projects out there. And we're going to be talking about a bunch more as we go. Yeah, if Kentucky Nature Preserves has others you want to come back on and talk to us about in the future, just let me know if any of our listeners are part of other states, nature preserves or citizen science programs, community science programs, researchers working through a university or whatever. Let me know. Send me an email and let's talk if you're interested in coming on because, yeah, like I said at the beginning, I'm a huge proponent of this. I've spent a lot of years working in this field myself, and it's so much fun. I mean, it really is fun to get people involved, or at least I think it is. It, it, exactly. And for people that want to get involved specifically in Kentucky now, we, we're partial Kentucky because we're a state agency <laughs> here, but we have two projects right now on iNaturalist. And if you create a profile and want to start uploading things, um, you have the option to join projects is what they're called. And it's just a way for us to find the data a lot easier, the specific data that we're looking for. And so we have two projects currently right now. One is called Documenting the Natural Heritage of Kentucky. And if you join that project, everything that you upload that you know, fits within that project parameters will automatically go to it. So you don't have to do any other work on that end. All you have to do is just join the project initially. We also have another iNaturalist project that you can join called Kentucky Roadside Native Plants. That's more of discovering some rare plants and some rare habitat that is just along these roadsides or power lines and right of ways. A lot of plants that are rare and endangered now are so because they don't have the necessary disturbance that they, they depended on when they existed here, like wildfire or you know, bison migrations. And so it's kind of funny because we're learning that, you know, mowing the sides of roads or mowing right-of-way power lines is the new disturbance that species is enjoying and needs to thrive. And so some of our rarest plants are found in those areas. So we encourage people to go safely <laughs> on roadsides and take pictures of things if you happen to be near one. Yeah, I'm hoping to be talking about that in more detail in a future podcast, but Yes, that's definitely something that we want to be looking at because like you said, there's a lot there that has been overlooked and understudied because it's in these very highly disturbed, highly maintained environments, but that's what these plants need. That's what they thrive on. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool. And I can, I can give you the contact information for our botanist that's heading that, that project. So um, that, that'll be really interesting to see over the years. Oh yeah, great. And I will definitely have links to everything that Maddie and I have been talking about to iNaturalist, some of these Kentucky projects and everything that'll all be in the show notes. So very easy for people to find as well. If people have any questions or want to contact you, how would they do that? So they can contact me through my email, which is probably the best. Uh, I have an office phone, but we're working from home. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just get the voicemail. But my email is madeline.heredia at ky.gov. And I'm sure Shannon can post that with the episode. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wondering how to spell that. <laughs> Having had a maiden name that nobody could spell and still having a married <laughs> name that a lot of people are like, huh? Yeah, I completely understand and we'll have that all posted for you. <laughs> okay, any last minute things? I just want to touch again on the, the importance of getting outside and you know learning about what's around you and maybe having an appreciation, a better appreciation for what's around you. And like Shannon has said, like we we have been science and nature nerds all our lives and we're still learning new things every day and you can too so uh, i hope that you all take a look at this app and try it out and i hope you enjoy it i love that sentiment and that's a perfect way to leave it so thanks a lot and have a great day bye-bye thanks bye. shannon bye
I really appreciate Maddie taking time to talk with us. iNaturalist is one of those things that I've been thinking about learning more about and starting to use for quite a while. I just never took the time to do it. I really like the fact that not only can I use it to help me learn about the plants and animals that I find, but it can also help scientists learn more about those plants and animals as well. After talking to Maddie, I think I'm going to finally set up an account and help document some of the plants and animals that I find, as well as to help me identify some of those mystery insects that I always discover as I'm taking pictures of different pollinators. If you aren't using iNaturalist, then I encourage you to take a look at it. I'm guessing that, like me, you can find multiple uses for it. And if you do use iNaturalist in Kentucky, please join the Kentucky Nature Preserves projects so that your observations can help them learn more about all of our amazing plants and animals. If you're in another state, then I'm guessing you have similar projects available for your state as well, and that those observations can be just as important for your states as our observations are for the Kentucky Nature Preserve projects. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask you to please take a minute and go to www.backyardecology.net slash interest dash survey and let me know what you are interested in hearing more about. I use the information from these surveys to guide the topics I cover in the Backyard Ecology blog and podcast. And until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yards and community.